On this episode of This Week in Linux, we got some new releases from core projects like Mesa and Pipewire. We also got some news from MyPaint, GTK, and a new Convergence app project called Maui. Then we'll check out some distro news regarding the Untangle firewall and some Red Hat news about CoreOS Container Linux. Later in the show, we'll cover some really interesting news from NVIDIA about ray tracing on Vulkan. Someone in the UK police thought it was a good idea to warn parents that their kids may become hackers, so we'll talk about that. And Microsoft announced their Microsoft Defender is coming to Linux. Then we'll round out the show with some great deals for games, books, and comics from the latest Humble Bundles. All that and much more coming up. I'm Michael Tonelli, Tux Digital and the Destination Linux Network, and this is your weekly source for Linux GNUs. Hello fellow geeks, Linux is everywhere. This is Ryan, also known as Das Geek from the Destination Linux podcast, and you're listening to This Week in Linux. Fill your brains. Up first in the show this week is a big release from a core project, specifically Mesa. Mesa 20.0, I'm not sure if it's Mesa or Mesa, but I say Mesa, so I don't know. Mesa 20.0 has been released. This is a 3D graphics library. It's actually the, the core library that runs the visual aspects of the 3D graphics for the core system of Linux, so pretty important. And anyway, this release switches to the new Intel OpenGL driver by default. It also adds support for Vulkan 1.2 for both AMD Radeon and the Intel drivers. The Radeon SI OpenGL driver now has GL 4.6 compliance as part of the switching to NIR. Valve-backed ACO, Valve made these ACO shader drivers, which are really cool. They make it, you know, using Proton awesome. They, and this is a code path, for, so the RAD, R-A-D-V or RAD-V is in, I'm not sure if it's RAD-V or RAD-5. I go with RAD5, sounds better, is in much better shape, and many other improvements have been made to the Mesa drivers. Just overall, it's a big major release for the Mesa drivers, and if you're using a you know rolling release, you can, you'll can you probably be able to get them pretty quickly. If you're using the LTS or something like that, it might be a little while before that happens. But anyway, it's really awesome. If you want to learn more about the Mesa drivers or this particular release, I'll have a link in the show notes below. Up next in the show is Pipewire 0.3. Now, Pipewire is a Red Hat project that is meant for multimedia processing. So this project is like the, it's an audio and video underlying framework, essentially, at, to help the improve the audio for using Linux. Now, this, really, this project aims to support use cases that are currently handled by Pulse Audio and Jack, and it also is trying to provide the same level of powerful handling of video input and output as other things. So... It's, it's really interesting because this is a 0.3 release, but also technically considered stable. So the team recently released this version, and they officially moved it into stable status, even though it is still 0.3. And some of the key features of Pipewire are capture and playback of audio and video with minimal latency, real-time multimedia processing on audio and video, multi-process architecture to let applications share multimedia content, which is really cool. GStreamer plugins for easy use, uh, easy use and integration in current applications. Sandboxed application support, so you can use like uh, flat pack support and stuff like that with it. And also, Pipewire is being because it's now stable. It's kind of interesting to see if it's going to be implemented into any distros because, well, it's a really cool project, but it's been in like the back burner sort for a while as far as like uh, people's attention. But uh, it's it has a lot of potential. It's kind of like a replacement to the existing stuff in the same way that Waylon is a replacement to X, as in it's something that's really interesting and really needed, but is probably a little far a little far ways off. But I'm super excited because the 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 structure of how they have Pipewire is really interesting, and maybe it won't be as long as I think it will be. Hopefully, it won't. But Pipewire looks really cool, and if you'd like to learn more about it, I'll have a link to it in the show notes below. This episode of This Week in Linux is sponsored by DigitalOcean. DigitalOcean offers the simplest, most developer-friendly cloud platform. It's optimized by managing and scaling apps easy with an intuitive API, multiple storage options, integrated firewalls, load balancers, and more. You can get all this plus access to the world-class customer support for as low as $5 per month. Or you can use their flexible pricing structure for as, zero, as little as 0 0.7 cents per hour. That's not 7 cents, that's 0.7 cents per hour. 
DigitalOcean also has 2,000 cloud agnostic tutorials to help you stay up to date with the latest open source software, languages, and frameworks. And you can get started on DigitalOcean for two months for free with a $100 credit by going to do.co slash dln. Again, you can get started on DigitalOcean with that $100 credit for free by going to do.co slash dln. And thanks again to DigitalOcean for sponsoring this episode of This Week in Linux and the entire Destination Linux network. It is awesome. We appreciate you so much. And if you are interested in checking out any of the cloud services, be sure to check out DigitalOcean because they make fantastic options. And I also love their marketplace that makes it easy to set up stuff. And also the management for the remote stuff and the dashboard. It's just, it's fantastic. So check it out, do.co slash dln. Up next in the show is the latest release of MyPaint. So MyPaint 2.0.0 has been released. And this is a interesting application because it's kind of like, if you've ever heard of paint.net, it's similar to that. So it's not an alternative to Photoshop, but it kind of is in some ways and not in other ways. So still, it's a really cool application because it provides a lot of value without having to do all the like the you know ridiculous barrier to entry that stuff like Photoshop has and other things like that. So uh, MyPaint 2.0.2 has added full Python 3 support. Now it still supports Python 2, but it will probably deprecate that eventually because, well, it just makes sense to do that. They've also added an imports layer feature now to the, the project. They've added some uh, improvements to the lo loading and feedback, showing a progress a feedback control for loading and saving. New layer views have been added. Curve editor points now snap to 0 0.5 increments instead of integer, full integers because it gives you more control that way. Linear compositing and spectral blending has been added. Uh, they've also done some new uh, symmetry modes like vertical, rotational, and something called snowflake. I don't know what that means. I should look it up. Uh, but I, you know, anyway, that's kind of interesting fun name for it, whatever it is. They've also expanded the flood fill functionality, which is really cool because if you're not really sure what flood fill is, it's kind of like a paint bucket feel. So where you click on something and it will just kind of create a fill across whatever uh, is the shape or element that you're hitting it on. And they've added new functionality for that, like offset, feathering, and also gap detection, which is really awesome. Uh, they've also added new brush settings and new brush input and all kinds of other stuff. So if you want to check it out, it's actually available as an app image. So no matter what distribution you use, you can download this from their GitHub repository and then just, you know, run it from there. So that's pretty awesome. If you'd like to learn more about MyPaint to version 2.0 or just MyPaint in general, I have a link to it in the show notes below. Up next in the show is some interesting news from the GTK team. So they have redesigned their website to help boost Linux app development. So if you're not aware, GTK is a toolkit, also known as the GIMP toolkit, that is used to create GUI for or graphic user, graphical user interfaces for applications on Linux. Now there's other competing toolkits as well, but GTK is one of the, mo the big, bigger ones and the most known ones. It's the one that's used by the, a lot of desktop environments like GNOME and Mate and many more. And this is interesting because the difference between the two is pretty staggering. So you can check in the show notes for the before and afters. I, uh, in the video, you'll see the, the current one, the after one, but uh, you'll see the other one as well in the show notes. It is very different. It looks way better than the previous version. So that's fantastic. So it's, it's actually kind of interesting because they've actually put like modified how they present stuff on their front page as well, not just the design overall. They've got better, they've got better documentation and better overall presentation and stuff. So they have new uh, all these different uh, languages that are available to use with GTK, like uh, JavaScript, Python, Rust, Vala, C, and all of those are like immediately represented on the front page, along with some names of apps that are made in GTK. Uh, you know, much cleaner approach to a website. So. Very nice. It's basically like they, you know, they had a website that looked like they haven't updated the in it forever, like a decade, and now they have something that looks modern, and I applaud them for that. So this should be good for developers and who are interested in checking out GTK. So well done to the GTK team for doing this. There is some issues though. Uh, we have a new someone helping out with the production of the This Week in Linux uh, podcast. His name's Ulfnik, so he's helping out with creating it, and he did a test with, with uh, running out through the different, uh, uh, basically the Hello World test on the 
uh, GTK website, the new GTK website. And he says, coming from zero GTK experience, it took me 16 minutes to create a GTK Hello World app. That's actually not that bad, but he said that he had a little bit of resistance because when he started the tutorial on a VM, there was missing like four packages that were not mentioned in the documentation. And he did say that three of them showed up in the terminal in an error. So he said he had to run a sudo apt fix missing or sudo apt install fix missing to get through all of those issues. And then he got another error saying that GTK3 was missing, so he had to install that as well. So it's kind of an interesting thing because uh, the tutorial doesn't say all this stuff. And while this is really good that GTK has you know improved their website and presentation and stuff, they also need to do some more stuff on their documentation because because that's going to be the most important piece. Like this is good for marketing and presentation, but they also need to make sure that the the you know onboarding as as simple and as easy as possible, and uh, and it'd be great. So if you're interested in checking out GTK or making applications on Linux, then be sure to check out the links in the show notes for the you know more details about this as well as the before and after versions. So yeah, links in the show notes. Up next in the show is the Maui project. So this is actually an interesting project for convergent applications. The people behind Nitrix are the ones who created this project. And if you're not aware, Nitrix is an, uh, a distribution for Linux. And they're very, it's very interesting because they have their own approach to Plasma. They have basically forked Plasma, sort of, and made a lot of customizations that are pretty interesting, as well as having heavy focus on app images, which is pretty cool, too. And now this project, the Maui Project, is an open source community for building convergent apps, as they describe for Linux desktops and Android phones. The community is developing MauiKit, a free open source modular front-end framework built with KDE's Kiragami UI framework, which will help make those convergent apps, but also does quick uh, QT quick controls, a, which uses this for a collection of d d templated controls and tools for building uh, user interfaces with, a Qt, with Qt Quick or QT Quick. So, you know, basically we go from one toolkit to another toolkit, uh, you know, it hap I didn't I didn't plan the releases. That's just when it happened. Anyway, so it's really interesting because the convergent apps automatically adapt their interface to the screen size. If you're not aware what convergence is, that's basically what it is. So you have an application for you know, a single application that, depending on where you're, what device you're using it on, or what size of the viewport that you're using, the application could modify and adjust itself to adapt to whatever size or viewport that you give it. So that's what a conversion app is, and that's what they're focusing on, which is pretty cool. It's kind of like how a website might do uh, responsive mode for whether you're using it on a phone or using it on, the, on a desktop or a laptop and that kind of thing. So MauiKit aims to help application developers build conversion apps that work seamlessly on desktop computers and mobile phones, but a lot faster using known technologies like C++, QML, and Qt. The user interfaces built with MauiKit follow their in-house human interface guidelines, or HIG, some people like to say, and apps made with MauiKit use the same code for both the mobile and the desktop versions, which means that users will get the same set of features as well for whatever platform they're using. This will also be useful for mobile Linux devices like maybe the PinePhone, where you could have these applications running on the PinePhone and not have to rebuild for specific structures and stuff like that. So maybe, maybe not, I don't know, but that's really interesting overall. And it's it's you know it's very early days, and you know, there's there's still gotta be a lot of work on their documentation and stuff, but it's pretty cool that they're making this this uh, Maui project for making convergent apps. I mean Kirigami framework also kind of does something similar but not as specific for that purpose. So anyway, if you'd like to learn more about the Maui project, I'll have a link to it in the show notes as well as a link to the Nitrix project because it's pretty cool too. So up next, we're going to do a little bit of some housekeeping. And first of all, I want to thank the people who are helping me make this show possible, and that are the patrons. So if you'd like to help me make this show and you know, give me, help me do devote more time to creating this show, and also the other content of Tux Digital, you can become a patron of Tux Digital by going to tuxdigital.com slash Patreon or tuxdigital.com slash sponsors to help me make the show because it is really, really, really awesome that so many people, there's even there's 80 people now, or patrons right now that are helping me make this show, and I want to say thank you so much for helping me do this because this is a passion of mine, and I love making this, this show and this content. So if you would like to help me make it, be sure to check out the links in the show notes below for more details on how to do that. 
Also, be sure to check out Library, because the Tux Digital channel and this podcast, naturally, are also a part of Library now. So if you've never heard of it, Library, or LBRY, is an alternative or competitor to YouTube. And it's really interesting, because the way they describe it, they describe the platform as secure, open, and community-run digital marketplace. Now, this is really cool because it's based on blockchain technology to power the platform. And that sounds like, you know, kind of ridiculous. But at the same time, it's pretty awesome, too, because how it works is just really interesting. And if you'd like me to do a video talking about Library, let me know, and I'll make that later on the channel because Library is pretty cool. So uh, we actually have a ch- the YouTube, the Tux Digital channel is now on Library if you'd like to watch the show there. And also the Destination Linux Network channel is also on Library if you'd like to check it out. And yeah, so Library is pretty cool. If you want to have an alternative to YouTube, there you go. Also, speaking of Destination Linux Network, check out the new podcast from DLN called Hardware Addicts. This is a computer hardware and technology podcast, and it's a really fun show about all sorts of stuff in computer hardware and the latest technologies and stuff like that. And episode three, which is the current the current version that's out, has covers routers, a NAS, network, network attached storage, if you don't know what NAS means. And it also has tips for beginners in choosing cameras. So like, you know, difference between point, point and shoot, the difference between DSLRs and mirrorless and all that kind of stuff. And it also there's a breakdown of PC cooling systems available for you to and how to con- how to cool your computer and that kind of like the best proper best solutions and that kind of thing. So we have that in the episode as well. And as I said, we not only am I a part of the Destination Linux Network, I'm also one of the co-hosts of Hardware Addicts. So it's pretty interesting, and I might be a little bit biased, but I think it's a great show. But I'd also like to point out that I'm not really a hardware guy, so it's kind of fun for me in the sense that this is a show that I don't really... This is a topic that I'm not really experienced in, so I get to learn. It's a, it's really cool because I get to learn while I'm being a part of the show. And if you aren't into... If you're not really a hardware person, but you like to, you're interested in it and you'd like to learn more, you could join me on my journey as well. So, yeah. Also, just want to remind you, that if you didn't know, that the Destination Linux podcast YouTube channel has been now converted into the Destination Linux network YouTube channel, which means it now has a consolidation of all the shows in the network in one place. So if you'd like to check it out, you can go subscribe to there and you can get all the content from all the podcasts, including some of the podcasts are exclusively on that channel. So be sure to check that out with like DLN Extend, Hardware Addicts, and some others. So be sure to check all that out. And uh, I will still be posting content on this channel, Tux Digital as well as this will be the main sh- channel for the This Week in Linux podcast. Uh, that's just because I've it's been around for so much so much longer that it makes sense to keep that going. Uh, but this will be like a new approach for, uh, you know, one-stop shop, so to speak, for all the DLN content and a way to introduce people to all of the content that they may not know about or, as a part of the rest of the network. So be sure to check it out if you're interested. And I'll have a link to the show notes as well as a link to the other fantastic thing that's a part of the Destination Linux Network, and that is the DLN Forum. So the DLN Forum is a really great place to kind of communicate with people and learn things, get help with stuff. And if you'd like to join This Week in Linux community, the Destination Linux community are all combined into the Destination Linux community a Destination Linux Network community on the DLN forum. So on the forum, you can talk about all the great content available in the network, share tips and tricks and you found throughout your Linux journey, get help from a wide range of users, or just hang out with fellow Linux enthusiasts. DLN forum is also a great way to interact with me because each episode of the show is posted on the forum and comments are not only welcomed, but encouraged. So the best thing about the DLN forum is no matter what user level you are, a beginner or a master sudoer, you'll enjoy being a part of the forum because it's not just a discourse forum, it's a community. Up next in the show is Untangle NG Firewall has released 15.0 version. So if you're not aware, Untangle it is, is a Linux-based or specifically even Debian-based firewall distribution, and it also works as a network gateway designed for like small to medium-sized like businesses and enterprise and that kind of thing. So they say in their release notes that the release of NG Firewall 15 provides an, a peace of mind to today's network administrators. While hackers are using newer technologies and attacking under the radar, Untangle is faster evolving to block their attacks before they even happen. Which, yes, that is a fantastic um, pitch, I guess. You know, uh, The new threat prevention app that they added analyzes web pages, and it has like this web page association stuff for apps and files, and it acts kind of like a gatekeeper to determine what is or is not allowed based on the assessed threat risk level. Uh, but the, one of the things that I thought was pretty cool and 
really interesting because they have filtering attached to various search engines now like Google and Bing. So they have this thing called Kids Search, kids with a Z because reasons, and this is a child specific filter that ensures that only age appropriate content or tries to ensure anyway that only age appropriate content in search results are are returned to content sensitive in like environments for a, like a school or a library or something like that. And it also gives flexibility to the administrators to customize this firewall stuff with like alerts and things like that and how and like what level to do this filtering. So it's pretty interesting. And if you there's there's other competitors in the space that are open source based uh, firewalls like uh, PFSense, but I think Untangle is the biggest one for like the Linux operating system because PFSense is based on BSD. So it's pretty interesting. If you'd like to check it out, I'll have a link to it in the show notes below. So up next in the show is some interesting news, and that is that Container Linux has reached end of li- will soon be reaching end of life. So there's a timeline that's been shared by Red Hat about the ti- about CoreOS's Container Linux being uh, end of life. And the reason why they, they gave for it being done was that they said that they were going to cease development of both Container Linux and uh, Atomic Host, and that a new Red Hat CoreOS and also like an associated Fedora CoreOS would integrate the concepts and like tech and stuff like and the like overall user experience and stuff of Container Linux into this new project. So it's pretty interesting because I gotta get okay, we'll do some more details about this, but so. Container Linux has announced that the last date for updates will, and that include uh, security patches will be May 26th of this year. And then from September 1st, published resources related to core OS Container Linux will be deleted or made read-only. So, and OS downloads will be removed, core update servers will be shut down, and OS images will be removed from AWS, Azure, and Compu- Google Compute Engine. And, you know, the, these are the uh, cloud services that allow you to download stuff, like the CDNs kind of thing. Uh, GitHub repositories, including the issue tracker, will become read-only. And they say the reason for deleting the OS images is to discourage continued use after the end of support. That part makes sense, but what doesn't really make sense is how soon they're doing the end of life. It seems pretty fast, because Red Hat acquired CoreOS in January 2018. And later in 2018, they said they were going to do this, but they said they were going to do this when they have a you know, an option for Fedora CoreOS or Red Hat CoreOS and that kind of thing. So it's kind of weird because Red Hat noted that, you know, there's a fork of CoreOS Container Linux, and you're like, why is there a fork? Well, the problem is that Fedora CoreOS is, was released like in January, like the first version was released in January, and it's not really a replacement. I mean, it's not an exact replacement. It's not like a drop-in replacement for Container Linux. In fact, there's no intention to have a migration path that I can tell because right now there is no migration path. They even say that in their their announcement, their release notes for Fedora CoreOS, that there's no migration path for Container Linux users to Fedora CoreOS. So you'd have to create a whole new stack and config structure and stuff. Maybe you could migrate it manually. I don't know, but it's interesting because Red Hat did note there's a fork and they and it's called Flat Car Linux which may be suitable for some users who don't want to jump to OpenShift. So because that's what it's going to be done for Fedora CoreOS or Fedora CoreOS and Red Hat CoreOS. So Red, Red Flatcar Linux is supported by a, a company in Germany called Kinfolk. So it's kind of it's a fork of the existing container Linux. So it might even be easier to transition to that one. I, I, I don't I don't know how good it is because I've never heard of it until this news came out. So it's pretty interesting because it's something that they plan to do, which is not surprising whatsoever, but they are doing it so quickly and kind of aggressively, yet what they're wanting people to use is not ready technically for production because they say it's not like, you know, they're not giving a stability claim or whatever. Uh, I don't know. It's kind of odd. I mean, technically Fedora never gives a stability claim, but it's also something that is kind of necessary because, you know, it's meant to be used in enterprise and like, you know, big servers and stuff. So it kind of needs to have that claim. I, I, it's just weird. But anyway, I think that Red Hat knows what they're doing. They probably know what they're doing. It's just kind of weird. And if you'd like to, ha- you know, let me know what you think, be sure to leave a comment below or on the Destination Linux forum. I have a link to that in the show notes as well. You know, it's pretty interesting. And I just, I'm just curious what you think about this. So. 
Up next in the show, NVIDIA is demoing something very interesting, and that is the porting of ray tracing to Vulkan. Now, there's a, a little bit of some memes about ray tracing being kind of like overblown and hyped up too much, but also it has potential to be very important in the future, even if right now it's not really there yet. Uh, that's just based on my uh, not actual experience because I don't have any cards that have ray tracing and stuff, but just based on the you know reviews and, res and like the reports about it in general. Uh, but anyway, NVIDIA has written a new techn technical blog post on their bringing HLSL ray tracing to Vulkan with the same capabilities of DirectX ray tracing. This is really interesting, so the idea is that the support for DirectX ray tracing will be coming to Vulkan soon, and there are reports, reports saying that this effort was made feasible by Microsoft's existing open source DirectX compiler, or DXC, with SPIRV backend for consumption by Vulkan drivers. So it's kind of interesting that NVIDIA is doing this because of the work that Microsoft is doing. You know, that's kind of interesting. I would rather NVIDIA just do it in general because it makes sense to do it, but whatever. For now, this DirectX ray tracing to Vulkan depends on NVIDIA's NV ray, ray tracing extension until the cross vendor Vulkan ray tracing extensions are finalized and published. And according to the NVIDIA developer blog, the NVIDIA VK ray extension with the DXC compiler and its SPIRV backend provides the same level of ray tracing functionality in Vulkan through HLSL as is currently available in DirectX. So this is really interesting. I can't wait to see what actually happens with like the benchmarks and stuff that are done whenever this happens, whenever this is completed. Because currently it's just a demo kind of preview, but they are saying that this is going to happen. And I look forward to see what happens with the benchmarks and all that stuff. So yeah, if you'd like to learn more about this, I have a link to this uh, blog, technical blog post from NVIDIA in the show notes below. Up next in the show, we have a new type of segment for you. It's the first time I've ever done this new type of edition, and this is the Linux Be Scary News, because the UK police, a version of one part of the UK police, warned that your kids may become hackers. <laughs> a Twitter user by the handle of G underscore IW posted a picture of a poster that went viral earlier this month. So they were warning, they actually wanted to cover this because there was, you know, updates to it. But warning parents to notify Mid West Midlands police if they saw Tor, Virtual Machines, Kylie Linux, Wi-Fi Pineapple, Discord, or Metasploit on their co child's computer. Wi-Fi Pineapple is not an application, it's a product, so that, that doesn't make sense. But whatever. Uh, they don't know these things, obviously. That's why they're making these ridiculous statements, and these completely absurd things like, oh no, this is horrible. You know, your kid has these applications installed on their computer. You must call the police? What? Like, what? <laughs> uh, whatever. But, you know, very quickly, Kali Linux responded within like 10 minutes or so. And they said that, I have to admit, it's sort of nice that they gave kids a roadmap on where to get started. We all know the easiest way to get a kid to do something is to tell them that you can't or they should not do it. And then they list specific items not to do. Too bad they didn't link to Kali.Training, the website for them, but, which fantastic. That'd be great if they did, but uh, that's, a good, that's a good jab. Uh, and it's very true. You know, Tell someone you, they shouldn't do it or they can't do it, and that makes them want to do it even more. So, yeah, totally not reasonable. Like This poster is just weird. But the next day, the West Midlands police replied accepting responsibility for it, saying that the poster produced by a third party was created as an aid to assist teachers with safeguarding kids in schools. It was taken from wider information on cyber tools, which could be used to commit cyber attacks, and but equally have legitimate purposes. So they are acknowledging that this is not necessarily a bad thing for the kids to have, but they're also telling people that they need to call the police in order to, if they find it. it what in sure you know there are also legitimate purposes that's why you'd call the police on it <laughs> they're, they're trying to cover themselves their their massive mistake they're trying to backtrack and go hey it's not actually that bad yeah it is uh but anyway it, it gives some comedy for the show so i guess there's a benefit there so what's really interesting that's Fantastic about it as well is that there's at the, look at the bottom right of the poster, it says NCA or National Crime Agency. And the National Crime Agency 
responded to this, denying completely having nothing to do with it. They say that the, the NCA was not involved in the production or release of this poster. There are many tools which the tech-savvy children use, and some of which can be used for both legal and illegal purposes. So it is vital that parents and children know how these tools can be used safely. So they do actually sort of agree to it, but they had nothing to do with this most this poster. So they're kind of like half distancing themselves and half agreeing. So ZDNet reached out to West Midland Police for comment, and they replied, This poster was produced to raise awareness among teachers, parents, and guardians to help them advise children how to stay safe online. Okay, fair enough. The poster highlighted some of the digital tools that children might be using at home. The software mentioned is legal and, in the vast majority of cases, is used legitimately, giving great benefit to those interested in developing their digital skills. However, as with any software, it also can be misused with those with much less legitimate intentions. The purpose of this poster was to provide a quick reference guide to the range of software available so that those parental responsibility for children and young people can start up a conversation about the safe and legal use of computers and technologies with these children and young people. Okay, that sounds great. If that was your intention, that's great. But why does it also say call the police if they find it? Because that implies that it's not your intention because you have no idea what you're talking about. So basically, this was a you know, a retcon trying to fix your mistake prior to making it. You know, So that's what, that's what it really really seems like so yeah if you are using these tools be sure to uh call the west bend police on yourself or or apparently (laughs) or whatever you know that the great thing about it is that they also list a discord and discord has nothing to do with cybersecurity or any kind of thing like that so it's just like they have no idea and also virtual machines can be done without having anything to do with it as well. And Tor is not a, a breaking, a, a penetration testing thing. That's just a security on your own side. Like, it's so silly that, like, they're just saying, like, oh, we heard of these things and we heard they were bad and therefore dark web and such. <laughs> anyway. So, yeah. Uh, Linux Be Scary News apparently exists now on this show. Also, something else that apparently exists that's pretty interesting is Microsoft Defender ATP Preview for Linux has been released. This is a public preview of Microsoft's Defender Advanced Threat Protection Suite, or ATP, and this is available for various different Linux distributions. It is used. It used to be called Windows Defender. Uh, last year, they rebranded it to Microsoft Defenders, that, like because they were trying to spread to spread it off to new platforms and stuff like that. Although, you know, there has been some issues of people saying it's not the best thing anyway. But, you know, whatever. I haven't used Windows in a very long time, so I have absolutely no idea. Um, but anyway, so the tool is also coming to iOS and Android later this year, which that makes more sense than a Linux version. It makes more sense for the mobile versions because the mobile is more susceptible to it and less, you know, Android is a mess. Let's just face it. Android's a mess. So they're saying that next week they're going to reveal some more stuff about that, you know, the mobile versions and everything. But for now, Linux, the server front, has availability for Microsoft Defender ATP, or Advanced Threat Protection, for various different distributions, including RHEL, CentOS, RHEL 7 and CentOS 7 and above, Ubuntu 16.04 LTS and above, but only LTS, so 18.04 and 20.04, I assume, whenever that whenever that comes out. You know, I, I do know it's April, but whatever. Uh, so, uh, SUSE Linux Enterprise Server or SLES, 12 and higher, will be uh, supported. Nine, uh, Debian 9 and higher is supported. And Oracle Enterprise Linux 7 is also supported by the preview. And this is interesting because in a blog post, Microsoft writes, We're announcing another step in our journey to offer security from Microsoft. Security from Microsoft. Interesting way you put that. With public preview of Microsoft Security ATP for Linux. Extending endpoint threat protection to Linux has been a long time asked for our customers, and we're excited to be able to deliver on that. Who's asking for this? Especially who's asking Microsoft for this? It, it, what? For Microsoft Defender for Linux, people are asking for that. Hmm. Sure. Sure they are. However, it is hilarious, again, that they're offering security from Microsoft, you know, as in, oh, you know, Microsoft is being the problem and you're trying to get security from them. I know that's not what they meant, but 
it's funny they use that words because it was just perfect. The company goes on to say, we know our customers' environments are complex and providing comprehensive protection across multiple platforms through a single solution and streamlined view is more important than ever. Next week at the RSA conference, we'll provide a preview of our investments in mobile threat defense with the work we're doing to bring our solutions to Android and iOS. That part actually makes sense. You should actually have you know support. You should have some sign of security tool on Android. I haven't, I'm not sure about iOS. I'm not really that familiar with that. I used it a long time ago when there wasn't an Android, but since Android came out, I was like, okay, I'll use Android. And then I realized later that Android was uh, a mess. So that's why I can't wait for a Pine phone with a bunch of touch because that's going to be awesome. And anyway, I talked, I've talked about the Pine phone many times before, but you know, we also talked about it earlier for the Maui project. So, you know, Hey, whatever. Uh, the arrival of Microsoft Defender ATP on iOS and Android is a response to the growing security problems that face mobile users. That's what they say. And actually, to be fair, that's a problem. So it makes sense that they would do that. So it'll be interesting to see how it works on the iPhone as well as the Android and see how, like, you know, because Apple places a lot of restrictions on apps. So I'm curious what will happen there. But not curious enough to get an, to get an iPhone or to get a Microsoft Defender on the phone. So... You know, whatever. If the reports tell me what happens, I'd be happy to check it out. But that's enough for this one. I think it's pretty funny. Two funny topics back to back. But well, I guess it's there's some le- there's some legitimacy to it because you know Linux is not invulnerable or invulnerable, of course. So it's not that ridiculous. But to say that they were being there had long term people asking for it, uh, probably not. Probably not. Up next in the show and the final topic for this week is. Uh, the a news section as well. You know, we, we talked about the Linux Be Scary news section, and we have another news section, and that is the affiliate links to help this show news. And this is related to Humble Bundle because Humble Bundle is a really great uh, project that also allows you to have affiliate links, and that I use them. And also, if you want to use them, it helps the show, helps the Tux Digital channel, and you know, overall helps me create this content and create this show. So I would pr- very much appreciate it if you were to do that. So if you're interested in these bundles, be sure to use the links in the description and in the show notes. So first of all, we have six topics or six bundles to talk about. And first up, we're going to talk about VR bundle. This VR bundle is for virtual reality games. And there are seven games and all of them don't aren't made natively for Linux. However, all of them work through Proton in some degree because Proton is awesome and fantastic and amazing. And thank you, Valve. Thank you, Co-Weavers. Fantastic. Anyway, so Platinum has three games in that category. So Moss, Space Pirate Trainer, and Cosmic Trip are all Platinum rating. Gold rating has Super Hot VR, Budget Cuts, Gorn, and Smashbox Arena. So they're all either Platinum or Gold, which is awesome. And in the next bundle, we have the Digital Tabletop Bundle 2. And we have most of these games actually work natively for Linux, like Gremlins Inc., Reigns, and Armello, For the King, and Slay the Spire are all Linux native games. The only game that's not is called Terraforming Mars, and it is 2 Platinum on Proton, which is fantastic. So if you're interested in any of those games, I have links to those in the show notes below. And if you're not interested in games, but rather game development, then you can check out the Polygon Game Dev, Dev Bundle. And this is the description of this the, on the Humble Bundle site says, you can create polygonal style games in Unity or Unreal Engine with this bundle of low poly assets pack. Uh, each pack features heaps of 3D assets, including characters, vehicles, buildings, props, environments, and FX to create computer, console, mobile, or VR slash AR games. This is pretty interesting. If you're interested in gaming, uh, check it out. I'll have a link in the show notes or game development specifically. And the next three things are uh, pretty cool. I think they're pretty cool. Uh, First of all, there's two book bundles and then there's going to be a comic book bundle, which I'll tie into something else when I get to that. But first of all, the first book bundle is the Cybersecurity 2020 by Wiley. So Cybersecurity 2020 by Wiley has many books, one of which has a really good name. I'll get to that in a minute. Uh, Threat Modeling Designing for Security, Reversing Secrets of Reverse Engineering, The Shell Coders Handbook, Secret Lie, Secrets and Lies, Digital Security in the Networked World, Social Engineering, The Science of Human Hacking. That's the one. Uh, we Have Root, Even More Advice from Schneier on Security, Malware's Analysis Cookbook, Tools and Techniques for Fighting Malicious Code, 
and also some Wireshark for Security Professionals book and many, many more, including a Metasploit framework book. And because, you know, we, but if you do get that book, you need to let the West Midland police know because, you know, that poster tells you to. Anyway, so uh, the the one that's the social engineering, the science of human hacking, very good name for a book, like very good for that title anyway, for that topic. Yeah, very good. Good job. Good marketing uh, approach. I like it. I want to read it now just because, you know, fantastic marketing. Uh, and also it's an interesting concept anyway, that the topic itself is interesting too. So, you know, whatever. Next up, more books and another book bundle. And this is something else that I'm also interested in. Uh, probably a little bit more so because I'm I'm a designer and I do care, I am interested in user experience or UX. And this is a book bundle for specifically for that. So if you're interested in any of this, uh, be sure to check it out. Uh, UX design is all about enhancing the user experience for a product, making sure it's easy to use for the customer. We've teamed up with Morgan and Claypool for a bundle of eBooks and topics for user experience. First of all, they have a lot of books in here. I'm only going to cover a couple, but Mobile Interactions and Context, A Designerly Way Toward t Digital Ecology, a Qualitative HCI Research Going Behind the Scenes, Interaction for Virtualization, Visualization, Oops, Interaction for Visualization, Contextual Design Evolved, Designing for Gestures and Tangible Interaction, Experience Design Technology for All the Right Reasons. Now, None of these actually are as catchy as the science of human hacking, but still pretty good. And if you're interested in UX, UX design, like I am, uh, I've, I'm very interested in it. I've been doing, I've been design, I'm doing design for a very long time. And I hope that many of the projects that are Linux related or open source related will check out a little bit more about user experience design because they need it. I'm not going to name anything, but a lot of them need it. Moving on. The final book bundle or comic book bundle is included is Bloodshot 2020 by Valiant. So Valiant is a comics company, Valiant Comics, and they're not one of the big ones. Like that's DC and Marvel. And then there's like Image. And then basically Valiant, I guess Valiant Dark Horse are kind of like competitors in that level. I don't know which one I'd put at the higher rank. I, I don't know. Basically, it's not one of the mainstream ones. It's one of the indie book companies. But they have a lot of co cool characters. Uh, my favorite character probably is Exo Man of War from them. And it's a really cool character. And they also have my second favorite, which would probably be Bloodshot. And Bloodshot 2020 is what this bundle's about. Mostly Bloodshot stuff, but also there's other stuff like Exo Man of War, uh, Ninjak, and Harbinger Wars are also included in this bundle. A couple of those for each. And uh, Bloodshot has volume 1 through 6 as well as many other like extra ones like you know Bloodshot Reborn and stuff like that. But the reason I wanted to talk about this one is one, I'm a fan of comics. If you've never, you know, had a conversation with me about comics, I love comics and uh, Valiant is a really good comic company and Bloodshot's a really cool character. Uh, it's kind of it's kind of a silly character but also kind of awesome at the same time. It's hard to describe. Another thing that I want to talk about is that this is a good marketing thing as well. In you know, not that necessarily the titles, but the marketing push that they're doing here is really good because when I saw that this was on a humble bundle, I was like, oh, that's cool. Aren't they making a movie about that? And turns out the movie's coming out in a couple weeks. Because I knew they were making a movie, I just couldn't remember when it was gonna happen. And if you want to know, Bloodshot, who is the guy who person who's playing Bloodshot is Vin Diesel. Which is pretty cool. If you want, if you're interested in checking out that movie, I will be watching it for sure because I like Bloodshot and I like Valiant, and uh, I'm looking to see. I'm looking forward to see what how Blood uh, Bloodshot is handled by Vin Diesel because that's pretty interesting. So if you like comics, then check out Bloodshot by Valiant. So yeah, also Exo Man of War, fantastic. Uh, anyway, I'm gonna stop nerding out on comics now, and we're just gonna go ahead and end the show. Well, I mean, there's an outro as well, but you know what I mean. Links in the show notes for all the affiliates links for the new segment, affiliate links that help this show news. Thanks for watching this episode of This Week in Linux. If you like what I do here on this show, please like that smash button and be sure to subscribe. If you'd like to support the Tuxedo channel, you can become a patron on Patreon or on Sponsors. And you can also check out the PayPal option and the other options that are available at tuxdigital.com slash contribute. Or you can order the Linux is everywhere t-shirt by going to tuxdigital.com slash Linux is everywhere. Or if you're in Europe, you can go to tuxdigital.com slash Linux everywhere EU for shipping inside of Europe. We also have ways to contribute without any cost to you by using our affiliate links. 
You can find links for places like Amazon, Humble Bundle, and many more by going to tuxdigital.com slash affiliates. And if you'd like some more podcasting goodness from me, then check out the latest episode of Destination Linux, as I'm a co-host of that show. And also, you can do that by going to destinationlinux.org. And speaking of Destination Linux, you can check out the rest of the content that is all so, tons of awesome stuff for podcasts, YouTube channels, and all kinds of stuff at the destinationlinux.network website. And be sure to join the forum, as I mentioned earlier in the housekeeping. It's, it's an awesome forum, and the Telegram is great. Discord's great. Be sure to check it out, destinationlinux.network. So thanks again for watching. I'm Michael Tanell with Tux Digital and the Destination Linux Network. And as always, keep using, learning, and enjoying Linux.